I'm going to time myself so I don't go too far over time. All right. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe, for organizing and inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this. Uh, I recently switched universities. So I was at Ohio State for a long time. Now I'm at Arizona State. Um, that has prompted me to take some time to step back and think about teaching a, a bit. And um, so that got me into philosophy of science. My wife says I'm having the most boring midlife crisis she's ever seen. Um, so, but in this room, I think that's not true. So uh, I'll see what I can do here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got to thinking about this. Um, we'll go on a journey together. Uh, some observations and some, an invitation at the end. One thing, uh, when I started to think about this, I teach a psychometrics class. And so one of the things that you talk about when you're teaching a psychometrics class is, well, what are you trying to measure? Um, and one of the things that I bumped into really quickly was the students that I was talking to had very different beliefs about what they were trying to accomplish than I did. And that was initially a barrier because they thought they were measuring depression and I thought they were doing statistical modeling. And so we had some difficulties discussing some of the things that were going on. And that was my fault. Um, and so they were asking, so I would ask them, is depression real? And we would have conversations about that. And the more I taught this class, the discussions about that got longer. And the other stuff I was doing got shorter. And so what happens, I found, uh, is the longer you teach psychometrics, the reliability part gets shorter and the validity part gets longer. Um, because the reliability is easy. It's not, but it's easier. Um, so other ways to think about this question, rather than saying, is depression real? You could, and I'm just picking on depression, right? It's, there's nothing unique about that. Uh, is the construct of depression, as measured by my scale, real? That is a different instantiation of the same kind of question, but is tractable in some ways, more tractable than the initial formulation. Um, the more statistically oriented among us might even prefer uh, is the construct of depression as represented by this latent variable in my model real. And those are three different questions that could have three different answers. And sometimes three different answers depending on what kind of day you're having. It just depends. Um, as I thought about these things, one of the realizations I had was how I approach psychometrics had a lot to do with things I didn't think about at the outset. So I was fortunate enough to, during my graduate training, be surrounded by folks, and, and since, to be surrounded by folks who've been thinking about this. So um, I hung out with Bud McCallum. Chris Preacher was at UNC when I was there, and he thinks about this a lot. I got to read stuff written by Joe, and we talked about this some. I got to go to OSU and hang out with Jay Myung and Michael Brown. So this has been something I've been steeped in, whether or not I realized it. Uh, and so I should also say, don't blame them when I screw this up. So it's not their fault, right? Like, your mileage may vary. But I had good inputs. The outputs are, are my problem. Um, so, but I, these were the kinds of questions that got me motivated. And so what I started to do in my psychometrics class was I had a week that I called psychology 50.5, which is just half of 101. Uh, and so, I, cause I thought, I don't even know how to have this conversation with the students if they have no background in some of the really basic ideas about philosophy and philosophy of science. And what I discovered when I asked, so the last time I taught this class, I had 30 doctoral students, about 15 were from psych and 15 weren't. Two of them had a philosophy of science class or anything similar, and they weren't the psychologists. And so I, I didn't even know how to have this conversation, but I thought it was really important to have, so I've started to add some of this in. Um, if you read philosophy of science, there's a really funny quote I'm going to mess up, but basically what it said was, um, inevitably when you see people who are researching philosophy of science, they weren't very good scientists and they're even worse philosophers. That might be true for me, so I don't know uh, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about all this correctly, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try anyway. So I, I sort of, and I'm just gonna run through some of this stuff. I, I suspect a lot of you know a lot of this, but I think it might be helpful just to frame some of what I thought I knew and some of what I discovered I didn't actually know. So there's things like positivism and empiricism, which are sort of these 
beliefs that uh, we can get to knowledge by just our observations, unaided observations of the world around us. That sounds really reasonable, but it totally doesn't work. And so pretty much no one takes that seriously, except most practicing scientists. There are a lot of practicing scientists. So like philosophers of science have rejected it as a, as a useful system for organizing things, but a lot of practicing scientists still feel that way. Um, so that's an interesting dichotomy I've noticed. Uh, deduction and induction, while they're incredibly useful, uh, deduction um, deriving conclusions from given statements, uh, facts, induction expanding beyond that in different ways. We are all inductionists in a way that we reason from a set of information to a broader set. Inferential statistics is inductive in its very nature, so all of us do induction. Deduction is spiffy, just doesn't work that well in practice. There's a lot of problems with it. but. It sort of suggests you can't just have these neat little rules and figure out the universe with a couple of rules here and the conclusion there. Um, so for example, the classic, you know, if you state two things are true, you can deduce a, a, a fact about the world. Deduction doesn't have a way of showing that those things are true. You just have to assume that they are. Uh, and so there's some, there are other problems too. So folks have moved on from that. One thing that we hopefully all have some experience with is Karl Popper and the idea of falsification. So this was a big deal and I thought it was really interesting. The notion here is that what we should do is to posit theories and then falsify them. And that uh, there's basically, it's the Roman gladiator arena where all the theories are out there trying to kill each other. And then at the end of the day, one theory stands atop the corpses of its rivals and yay, I'm the, the best theory in the land until a bigger one comes and kills it later. Cause like it just keeps on going. Um, and so th this is about where my thinking about these issues kind of stopped. That's what I got and like, oh, that's cool. Um, it turns out that doesn't work. The philosophers of science have utterly rejected that the utility of that as an organizing principle um, for science because it actually has very little resemblance to what happens in science, it turns out. Um, so there's been some extensions of that. Deborah Mayo uh, has this idea about severe testing. One of the big problems with falsification is if you falsify something, it's not always obvious what you falsified. Uh, theories that we talk about or a hypothesis that we test, it usually isn't just a thing. It doesn't just depend on one thing being true or right. There are tons of auxiliary assumptions that go into what we're testing. And if you falsify something, you don't know what you falsified. And then you go looking for what you falsified, but that has all the same problems, so that's really difficult. And then when you actually look at the history of science, um, if we got rid of every theory we falsified, we wouldn't have any because we use false theories all the time. So like the satellites orbiting, we got to the moon with a false theory. That was pretty cool. Um, so false theories can be useful even if they're not true. So but there has been some extension there. So the people are still thinking about the utility of falsification, but it's evolved. Um, also probably if you know anything about philosophy of science, you know about Kuhn and the idea of paradigm shifts. That's really cool, except they've also said that doesn't work at all. Uh, the way that Kuhn talked about it, because he talked about incommensurability, which means that be choosing between two paradigms was totally based on what you like. It was utterly relativistic. There was no objective way to compare paradigms because paradigms were literally different views of the world. <laughs> and if you view the world one way and I view it another, we don't have a common language to talk about things, so we can't objectively compare on a, on a fair basis. Um, and it's interesting because some of the philosophers of science who've been writing about this are a little cheeky about it, and they said basically it's like what he proposed was a popularity contest. That new paradigms won because the people who liked them were cooler and did a better job selling it. That's how paradigms win. Um, that's not the only way that paradigms win, but it's, that was what bugged a lot of the philosophers of science, that there wasn't a, a real objective basis for comparing paradigms if you subscribe to Kuhn's philosophy. Um, that led to folks like Lakatosh and Loudon expanding that and elaborating on. So you went from paradigms to these ideas of research programs, these ideas of research transitions or traditions. And what they were really trying to do was to remove some of this relativistic, you can choose whichever one you like, to try and come up with, well, they're not that different. So this idea of incommensurability that shifting views might still have some connectivity. They're still trying to account for the same facts and maybe there's some commonality in how we view facts between paradigms. So there's been elaboration on those. They've made some progress there. Um, and then you start getting into the fun stuff, uh, which is very, very different. So if you want to just burn everything, you can go read some fire, Abend, um, who basically says, you know, 
your rules are just dragging me down, man. Uh, humans should be free and we should be allowed to do what we want and your government shouldn't pick ideologies. You can just do whatever. Uh, you people who, who favor science, you're just being dogmatic and there's no reason to think science is any better than any other way of knowing things. So get off your high horse, stop bothering me. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's a fair synopsis. Um, you get into these, so the second one, second and third, are, I think are really interesting for us, particularly in the quantitative methodology world. Um, I'll start with the Bayesianism. So not only is Bayes uh, something we see a lot from an estimation standpoint, it is actually a philosophy of science. Um, and so the, there is Bayesianism, great, because Bayes didn't have an ism before, so now there's Bayesianism. Um, and What's interesting about that is there's some really fascinating disagreements in the philosophy of science community about how useful it is as a philosophy of science. There's a camp that says, if you think anything else, you're a blithering idiot. And there's a lot of other folks who say it's just fundamentally unsound and unsalvageable as a way to think about science. And so there's a lot of like ongoing argument about that as an outlook on how we should understand knowledge. Um, Realism, anti-realism, and scientific realism. So this gets to the heart of is depression real? Um, realists say that what we're trying to do is to understand, the goal of science is to understand true things about the world. I mean, that's a gross oversimplification, but it's a short one sentence version of what realism is. Anti-realists come in different stripes, but they basically say variants of, I think you're high, that's dumb. We can't ever know truth but we can just have models that are useful. And that's good enough. And again, that's an oversimplification, but uh, not unfair. Scientific realists try and walk the tightrope between the two and say some version of, I, I don't know if I can know truth, but I might be able to say true things and that might be okay. And if that sounds confused, it sort of is. And the philosophers of science agree with you that it's kind of a confused position. Um, but they're really struggling with how we think about what our goal is and how the methods that we're using are aligned with goals or not. Um, so that's, again, there's a lot more going on here. Uh, and I am a novice when it comes to philosophy. So but I think these are accurate representations, if a bit brief. Okay, so audience participation. Uh, please raise your hand for the world to see if you believe that psychology is a science. Okay, that's a f f it's fair. You can, you can reject the premise of the crappy question. Uh, so that's, that's good. So you are in line with most philosophers of science. Most philosophers of science have accepted that social sciences can be sciences, and psychology was one of the first ones to breach uh, to make that beachhead and be a vanguard in that sense. So not all, but most, the overwhelming majority of philosophers of science would say psychology is a science. Okay. Is statistics a science? So please raise your hands if you believe that statistics is a science. Okay, so more ambiguity about that, which is reflected in the philosophies of science. There are some folks who think it is. There are some folks who think it isn't. There are a lot of folks who think that there is a little bit and a lot of application of that little bit that might look scientific. So, and there are more complex views about this too. But so good. So you are a good proxy for sort of what philosophers of science seem to be breaking down at on this stuff. This is a much newer question. The, the is psychology a science has been asked for a while. This one actually is pretty new. And if you look around for conversations about this, they're not that deep yet. So this is kind of gearing up. They're turning to this and talking about it, which I think is really interesting. Okay. So why do we teach statistics to scientists? It's an actual question, sorry. I mean, this, it's, not, it's not a rhetorical question, it's an actual question. Yes. Okay, it's a tool was an answer. Other answers? You can, you can endorse that answer or give a different answer if you would like. Structures are thinking. Structures are thinking, okay. So it's a cognitively organizing set of principles, okay. Helps us answer questions. Helps us systematically deal with uncertainty, okay. Good answers, I like all these answers, excellent. 
Okay, a way of knowing is another possible answer. So I, I think these are all valid ways to think about why we do this, but I think it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about this, which is probably more of a commentary about me than it is about anything else. Um, so I started to think about why, and my initial reaction was, well, it's a useful tool. Re scientists can use this tool to do science. Um, well, if we think about statistics as a tool, then presumably we teach it to scientists because we, and they, because they show up to our classes, believe it will be useful to them in their scientific endeavors. Okay. Um, so then I started thinking about, so this is where we're, we might go off the rails a little bit here. We'll have to see what happens. Um, outside of the context of statistics, if you're teaching someone how to use a tool, you would want to know what they're gonna use it for. Because a lot of tools can be used for more than one thing, right? And you can't necessarily teach everyone every use of every tool all the time. And you'd want to ask specifically, well, what are you going to use it for, right? Um, you can use a hammer to drive a nail into something, or you can use a hammer to remove a nail that has been driven into something. And the instructions you would give someone for those two tasks with that same tool are quite different if you were just trying to instruct them with that. Um, However, um, as far as I'm aware, you cannot use a hammer to make a penguin, like an actual penguin, not a wood version of a penguin. And so it's useful to know what people intend to do with the tool. One of the reasons is so that you can say things like, oh, I'm sorry, you can't do that with this tool. This tool doesn't accomplish that, or there's a more efficient tool to do that. But you have to be very clear about what they are trying to accomplish and be very clear about what can be accomplished with the tool that you're handing them to be able to make that match about giving them the tool that can be used to accomplish what they're trying to get done. Okay, so this uh, really smart guy, uh, also devastatingly handsome, this guy. It's rare that you get those two in the same package, but really. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, he said, statistics is the technical methodological language that scientists use to communicate with one another. It has embedded within it the philosophical basis of how we conduct our science, including statements about ethical scientific practice and causality. If statistical procedures provide foundational support for psychological research, how can otherwise sophisticated scientists treat philosophy, ethics, causality, and our basic language as mere procedures? So, uh, I, I read this paper when it came out. Um, I've read this paper a bunch, uh, and I've thought about it a lot. And it was one of the things that triggered this whole slide into philosophy of science. So my wife hates you a little bit right now, but she knows you're a good person. She doesn't blame you entirely for it. It's mostly my fault. Um, so where I am stuck, and I, I the first time I read this, I loved it. I was 100% on board. And as I have thought about it more, I'm not as sure that I love it anymore. Um, and I don't think I disagree with the premise. Uh, what I wonder about is the extent to which we're asking people to understand or to do things every time they try and use a tool that we ourselves would never do if we were trying to use a tool. So when a biologist uses a microscope, they have to understand some of the things that a microscope can do and some of the things that it can't do and some of the problems that it encounters. They don't have to revisit every principle about optics every time they use a microscope. It is a tool. And a tool to be useful can't require recreation every time they approach it. And so I feel like there's a, there's a boundary here where asking people to be informed users of a tool is one thing, but I also wonder if we're not missing a distinction between using the tool versus understanding at the outset what a tool is capable of doing versus what it is not capable of doing. Because um, I think in some extents, I do think statistics should be mere procedures sometimes. I don't know that someone can be a scientist and have to be a statistician to be a scientist. I don't think that's what Joe was saying. Um, and he can tell me when I'm done about how I'm wrong about this. Uh, but I think I'm trying, and so what you're getting here, and I apologize for this, I'm still trying to figure this out. Uh, I don't know how I feel about this. 
I felt very strongly this way and I feel less strongly this way now. And I feel like um, I, I'm trying to f articulate a little, a little more deeply in my mind to what extent it is okay for it to be a mere procedure, under what circumstances and what pre-existing conditions might have to exist for it to be comfortable in that sense. Um, but I don't know. Uh, like I said, this is really a work in progress. So, I genuinely mean this. I know sometimes people say like, oh, email me. I really do want to talk to people about this. I am struggling. I don't know. Um, I have read enough philosophy of science over the past few months after Joe started thinking about this to become really dangerous, but not enough to become really competent. Um, working on that still. I think about how I teach statistics a bit in this light, but I'm curious to hear from all of you uh, here and in the uh, etherwebs about how you view that in interplay between what the scientist understands their job to be and what we tell them about what our tools can do in that light. So I hope to continue the conversation in the future with all of you. Thank you very much. Mike Edwards is right there, see? Uh, and you're not just instructing him, so please interact. Uh, we have time for a quick question or two. When I was an undergraduate, I took a couple of philosophy of science courses, and I had two conclusions. It was very interesting, and I loved thinking about it, but it had nothing to do with science, the way science is done. Later in graduate school, I read an article by John Platt called Strong Inference, and I said, oh, this is not philosophy of science, but this is how science is done, or should, good science is done. And he led me to TC Chamberlain, and that was multiple yeah, so the question was about the distinction between philosophy of science and how we do science. Uh, and the philosophers of science talk about this. And I do worry that um, there's a cart and a horse problem here. Uh, and so where I find a lot of value in reading philosophy of science isn't necessarily the, th I'm not necessarily interested in the theoretical ideas about how we build knowledge. I am interested in how knowledge is built. Uh, like scientists doing it and how that may or may not function, I'm not specifically interested in, but the ideas about what could, how could we contribute to a process? What counts as knowledge? What, what kinds of arguments can work and what kind of arguments can't work? So the philosophy part to me is a little more interesting than necessarily the philosophy of science part, um, but I, I Yes. And that's part of, um, like, Kuhn is an interesting example where it sounds really good as long as you don't actually look at history. And if you go back and look at history, there's almost no evidence that, in, in the way, in the very prescribed way that it was um, dictated by Kuhn, there's almost no evidence that that's actually how things function. But it in and of itself has changed how scientists think about science. So now we're in like weird dynamical system feedback loop stuff and my brain starts to hurt. But good point, I totally agree. Um, 